Welcome, ladies and gents. I'm Dan the Man Munoz, host of Movie Menu Interviews, where we interview up-and-coming filmmakers to discuss their films from idea to completion. On today's episode, we'll be interviewing filmmaker Patrick Hogan, writer and director of the short film, Virtually. I'd like to welcome Patrick Hogan to the show. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate it. Hey, thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Also joining us is our sound guy, uh, Mike Stan. Thank you, Mike, for for making sure we sound good. Yeah. <laughs> thank um, you, Mike. Make me make, make me sound good. Oh, thank you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so the reason why we do this show is to discuss the process for future filmmakers out there, to talk about what worked on your project and what you would change for your next project, plus any advice you'd give to our listeners. So, Patrick, would you give us a little background about yourself? Sure. I uh, have lived here in L.A. for uh, over 20 years now. I'm originally from the island of Guam, uh, oh, really? which is the westernmost territory of the United States. My family's from Ohio, but they moved to Guam before I was born. I was, so I was born and raised there. Then I went off to college, came back to Guam, worked in uh, independent, low-budget TV commercial production for three years, which if you want a good foundation in filmmaking— you know, low budget commercial production is <laughs> is where it's at. Internationally, because, yeah, because uh, usually the crew is you. <laughs> and so it's you, a one man crew. You learn everything. You learn to work the camera. You learn editing. You off. I did the voiceover for a lot of the commercials. You, you know, you have to learn every facet of production, which I think you're wearing uh, many hats. You, many hats, and I think if you're, especially if you're a director, I think knowing at least some level of every job on the set can be very useful to you. I think the more you know about the other jobs, the better you can communicate with them towards your vision. So uh, I did that. And then um, I applied three times and I finally got into USC film school. So uh, I moved here to LA, not knowing a soul in this town. My wife and I moved here. We didn't know anybody. I was that guy asking about where Supple Vita Boulevard is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, our first days driving around trying to find a mall, you know, we didn't know where we were. But I went to USC and then uh, out of that um, made some films and I also got into sound editing and uh, I'm still working as a sound editor. When you went to films. when you went to USC Film School, did you have like a focus? Like you said, you went you got into sound design, but do you also go for that program when you went? Was it yeah. a directing program, writing program? Well, um, I, I was overall in the, everything. Yeah. Well, they I don't know how they do it now, but at that time there was the production program, mm. which was. Uh, directing and all the technical skills, and you did a little writing. Then there was a separate writing program and a separate producing program and then a critical studies, you know, film theory program. So I was in the production program because I wanted to make films. And like every other person in the entire world, I came to L.A. to become the next Steven Spielberg. (laughs) So directing was the big focus, mainly because I'd always been a writer. And I thought, well, you know, the writing is, is just paper and pen. I can do that all the time. Mm-hmm. But getting access to the equipment and the know-how of how to work the equipment. This was pre-internet, so you couldn't just go on Google and, and pull up, you know, how to operate a red camera. <laughs> uh, so I, I went in towards directing. But what's nice is USC required that you crew on other people's films as part of the program. Requirements? Yeah, that was a requirement. And so you had to learn some of the other – Kind of going back to what I was saying earlier, even as a director learning the other facets. So they forced you or required you. um, They didn't force you to leave. Uh, (laughs) They required that you crew on someone else's project before you could pitch your own project to direct. And uh, I had been in audio before that. I had been a radio DJ in college to make some money and have some fun. And I actually wanted to do picture editing as the crew to to learn more about picture editing. But – the best project that was available that quarter, I thought, I, when I read the script, I was like, oh, this one's a good one. And I saw the other people he was assembling. I was like, he's assembling a really good crew. And he's like, I need a sound editor. And I was like, okay, I'll do the sound on this one because I want to be on a good project. I mm-hmm. think being on a quality project to me was more important than just being on whatever project. It mm-hmm. so the sound, and I got lucky uh, that particular quarter, the, the um, professor for sound was a guest lecturer named Roger Party. Um, if you look him up, he did like Last Action Hero and Waterworld. Really nice guy. Mm-hmm. And he kind of mentored me that quarter in sound. And at the end of it, it was a really good film. It won the Bronze Student Academy Award oh, that's uh, awesome. that year. And I started getting offers to do more sound work. And they eventually started becoming paid offers. And I went, hey, Even wait a better. second. <laughs> yeah, I went, 
I now, went, did hey. you did you find yourself since you worked crew on low budget commercials in Guam that that helped you in college learning all the other aspects of of production as well into yeah. going sound? yeah I, I think so you know film school is you know you have people who come to it with no background whatsoever so some of the intro classes are very you know they're beginner classes mm. teaching you know the rudimentary skills I learned a lot of that stuff even though it was a a refresher in some ways because I kind of already grasped the big picture. Mm-hmm. I could kind of focus on the little things that I was learning that were new to me uh, and get a, a stronger grasp uh, of it. And I had a lot more fun because when we had to make the little films, I was just, I was making these funny little stupid films. That I, <laughs> <laughs> if, that where I else can you make stupid films but then film school? Film school is where you're supposed to experiment and exactly. learn. Exactly. And, and be artsy. So what made you want to get into film? What made you apply to film school? What made you want to work in independent commercials when you went back to Guam? How was that aspect entered your life? Well, I, I, I originally wanted to be a writer. I, I started writing. Like writers of films or a writer like well, just, a novelist or uh, a writer in fiction, general? Fiction, no, yeah, novels. Or I started writing when I was eight. So I don't think I knew what the career path was at that point. I just liked writing. And then I got into acting for a little bit. I really enjoyed doing plays. Like in high school? Before that even, I started, Mm -hmm. I I got my first little role in a community theater production when I was 11. My very first role was, I was the young waiter in the background holding a tray. (laughs) I had no lines. I just stood there. But I loved it. I was hooked. You got bit by the bug. Yeah. So I I did that for years. And as I actually was in high school and started thinking about, okay, now I'm going to have to graduate from high school soon. I'd always loved films. Um, My very first film that I remember. Well, I, I think I remember seeing one of the Disney Fantasia movies, mm-hmm. but um, my first big memorable film experience is Star Wars. I'm just old enough to have seen it in the theater when it first came out when no one knew what it was. And I I was so young, I can't remember anything else about that time in my life, but I can tell you I, we waited in line in front of a shoe store at the mall to get into the theater. And I remember that when we walked out, I asked my mom if we could see it again. She's not a movie person. She's like, well, okay. And I actually turned around and started to walk back into the theater. And she had to say, no, no, no I mean, we'll, we'll come back tomorrow. <laughs> I thought you could just, you know. Yeah, go, yeah watch it yeah. multiple times. Yeah. So I'd always loved film. So in those teenage years, I loved acting. I loved writing. I loved movies. And so I started trying to write the script. I didn't know what I was doing. Like the format was all wrong and everything was – every rule <laughs> they tell you not to do, I did because I didn't know any better. I was 13. I made a little film. I think I made it when I was 16. It's my first film. It was shot on a VHS camcorder, and then I plugged that into a VHS deck. And the editing was I would hit play on the camera and then record Third. on the deck. And then I would hit pause when I wanted to cut. And then I would <laughs> fast forward through the footage to the next shot I needed. And that's how I edited the whole film together. Onto the VHS tape. On a VHS tape. And then I played that VHS tape in real time onto another VHS, recording it through a mixer. And I mixed live music and stuff. <laughs> Alpha CD. I mean, it was very rudimentary, but it was called The Pen in the Heart, and it was about a serial killer who kills people using a ballpoint pen. Uh, at 16. And that was my first, yeah. And way That's before, awesome. you know, I look at what the 16-year-olds have now, and I'm so jealous. Again, I was using a v, like the big on-your-shoulder right. VHS camcorder and then just hitting pause and recording pause on the, on the deck. Mm-hmm. And now I see, you know, Filmic Pro app on your iPhone and, you know, all these professional edit programs that cost like two bucks. <laughs> um, so it's just not fair. Yeah. So, so as I got old enough to start thinking about going off to college and stuff, I realized, you know, I'm not really that great of an actor and it's a horrible life. <laughs> <laughs> and all the actors out there can nod and agree. It's a tough life. You got to really love it and want it. And I didn't want that that badly, but I love storytelling and I thought, boy, I'm really into the tech side of filmmaking. I like writing. I, you know, I like being behind the camera directing actors. I'm like, I'm going to be a filmmaker. And I've stuck with it all these years. Nice. Now go on and talk about what you've worked on in the past. So after college, where did you go next? So after undergrad, I went back to Guam and I worked for a TV station there for three years. And that's where I really learned low-budget commercial production. I, right. was, I wrote the scripts. Nine, 99% of the time, the script was something like, Come down to Al's Furniture. We specialize in all your furniture needs, you know, from <laughs> bedroom sets to, you know, it was that kind of commercial. Right. And then you'd go down there and you'd have two hours to just basically film everything in their store and then go out front and get a shot of the front of the store. Then you go back and you have an hour to edit it together. Then you slap a needle drop track on it. And then more often than not, I would do the voiceover as well. <laughs> um, so I did that for three years. But in that time, I was applying to USC, mm-hmm. getting rejected and applying to USC. And then finally, 
Maybe they just got tired of my persistence and they were like, <laughs> boy, it's this guy again. Let's just get him through here. So uh, I moved here. And so then when I graduated from film school, um, I made my thesis film, which I shot on 35 millimeter film. It's a really great film. I just describe your film. So when I started film school, I did what everybody else did. And I wrote these very dark, depressing sagas of agony and <laughs> <laughs> suffering. Um, one of my films was, you know, uh, about a guy trying to figure out why his wife died. <laughs> you know, oh, okay. So the normal yeah. type of normal film, film school. school yeah. <laughs> but by the time uh, I got done to do my thesis project, I was like, I want to do something more fun. So I did a, a kind of a romantic screwball comedy kind of thing about a woman who meets the perfect man, the guy who's like, he's literally the guy out of her dreams. And he gives her his business card. The movie's called The Business Bis Card. Mm -hmm. Which is on your IMDb. Yeah. She drops the business card and it blows away in a gust of wind. And then the whole movie is her chasing the card. <laughs> and she, she gets in a sword fight in the park with a guy who's cleaning the park with the long stick. You know, with the, oh, yeah. The, uh -huh. She gets in a fight with him. She climbs down into the sewers and sexually harasses uh, a maintenance worker down in the sewer because <laughs> the card falls down the back of his pants. And, you know, it's that kind of like very slapstick funny. And then at the end, she finds the card only to discover that maybe the perfect man wasn't the perfect man. But throughout this entire adventure, she's been running into this guy who's kind of like her foil who gets in her way. And at the end, she realizes maybe, you know, she was focusing on the wrong guy. Oh, and it, very lighthearted. It, yeah, it was very lighthearted. It, um, you know, it's big to say it was the first student film purchased by an airline to play on when they were beginning the uh, oh yeah the on demand mm -hmm. movies on planes. So Virgin Airlines mm -hmm. actually bought it and put it on their planes. Congrats, that's Probably awesome. Because it was the only student film ever made that wasn't dark and <laughs> <laughs> that was lighthearted and lighthearted. <laughs> you know, people on airplanes don't want to see you know death and destruction. <laughs> yeah, <it's, no. laughs> uh, but it it did well, and I wrote. Um, now, one thing I learned is you know especially in Hollywood is they, everybody has to kind of have their genre or their style or their, you know, what they're about. And the problem was I followed up that very lighthearted comedy. It was qu quirky and funny, but I wrote a intensely personal coming of age story drawing details from my own life, but it wasn't slapstick. It wasn't big. It had quirky, funny moments to it, but it was much more heartfelt. Mm -hmm. Pope's dreams. Then that's Pope dreams. But when I came out of film school, the short got me a manager, but he didn't want me to do anything with Pope Dreams. And everybody I met with after coming out of film school who saw that was like, yeah, we love that Pope Dream script, but that's not something we would Want to work with. Yeah, we wouldn't develop that. What else do you have? And I hadn't written anything else yet. So in the meantime, my sound career was taking off. So I was doing the sound work and, and making good money. It was nice. <laughs> that's always good. <laughs> yeah. That's after a being a poor film student, um, you know. Having a job that gives you health benefits, <laughs> you know, That's a, pension the goal. Plan, a pension plan, <laughs> you know, those are nice. Um, uh, so I was doing that and uh, I tried to write with my manager. He, he wanted me to write a, a comedy. And at that point, there was the whole American Pie. Oh, right. And mm -hmm. so he wanted – I came up with an – it's a cool idea. The premise was – it's really funny. A Mountain Dew Gen X, like, what do you call him? Thrill seeker, like oh, a guy who yeah. does like base jumping and skydiving. Mm -hmm. Here's this rumor about this woman who every man she's ever had sex with dies. So he decides that's the ultimate risk challenge. Taking, yeah. yeah, ultimate risk taking. So he decides he's going to track her down and have sex with her and see if he can survive <laughs> when everyone else has died. So she's like a black widow type yeah. of. Or yeah. Nice. So, and it's, you know, like a crass sex comedy. Right. Uh, and I wrote it, but it just, my heart wasn't into it i was doing it because that's what was, was popular, at the, popular time. at the time and what he thought would be a better vehicle for me and it went nowhere and then he and i parted ways because i was like yeah this i i spent a year writing this and i'm not very happy mm -hmm. so at that point i decided okay you know what i'm just going to make pope dreams on my own at that point the digital cameras had started to come out panasonic came out with a camera and they were offering grants to filmmakers to use the camera so i applied I don't know if you win or they chose me or whatever, but I was picked as one of the 10 filmmakers to get to use this camera nice. for three weeks. And then I found a guy I'd gone to film school with who was actually the, the director of photography on my short film. He'd actually purchased one because he was getting it. He was a working cinematographer at this mm -hmm. point a couple of years later. So he had one. So I'm like, oh, we got two cameras. And then we just basically you know, went out and this was pre-crowdfunding and stuff. And we through friends and family and a couple. We found a couple investors who were looking to get into film who loved the script. 
we cobbled up just enough, like just barely <laughs> enough <laughs> to make the film ourselves. But that way we had complete and total control, control over it. Yeah, and we made it. And it, it was a great film. We, we got into Atlanta Film Festival. We went there. We had a great time. Closing night ceremony, we weren't going to go because we, we had met a guy who uh, owned this incredible sushi restaurant. And he took us out for the evening because he loved our film. And we were like eating and drinking and having this is a great time. And they were like, oh, the, the awards are soon. And the other film that was the big film, and ours was a little film, but the, the, the big film of the festival was a film called La Quintanera, which was about a girls here in L.A.'s oh, yeah. uh, La Quintanera. Uh, uh-huh. And it had won best film at Sundance. Mm-hmm. So we're like, well, that's going to win. We're not going to win anything. We're not up for any other awards. You know, why should we even go? But then we're like, oh, you know, we should go just because. So we showed up, you know, maybe slightly tipsy. And then when they and then they announced, and the best film is Pope Dreams. And we were Whoa. all like, we were all like, what? Wait, that's us. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have just, you know, we didn't have any remarks prepared. We just walked up to the podium, and I, I we probably rambled. I don't know. Uh, and then the next day, we was like, that movie Pope Dreams won really. <laughs> It did well, and we landed a good distribution deal. The problem was um, this was 2008 when we struck this deal, right when the entire nation went into the right. worst recession, recession since the Great Depression, mm-hmm. and the bottom fell out of everything. And this company, which had been doing very well, struggled, and they, they eventually folded. And they basically just kind of sold off all their assets for, for pennies on the dollar. Mm-hmm. So the film did well, but it didn't do – you know, just look at the draw. Right. You know, had this film come out two years prior, it would have been a great success, and this company would have done great by it. One important thing to learn about filmmaking is sometimes, no matter what you do, certain things are out of your control. Mm-hmm. In this case, we released the film at the absolute worst possible time in literally 50 years to have, <laughs> to have right. released the film. <laughs> 60 years. At the time, we were naive enough to think, well, we're just going to make a good film, and – that's, that's all it. we have to do. Mm-hmm. That's that's another lesson for up and coming filmmakers is making a good film just makes one good film. It has nothing whatsoever to do with the next film. The key is to not have to start from scratch each time. The key is to figure out a way to use that one good film to leverage into the next one and the one after it. And it requires f- thinking maybe even before you make the first film how you're going to route yourself yeah into that. go 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 through that like it's you know it's like a business plan right mm-hmm. it's like if you open a restaurant it isn't like okay that first day the food's gonna be really good and then well, what about day two well we'll worry about that you know we'll worry about the second day after the first day is done no you have to have the food already ordered you have to have the menu you know mm-hmm. you have to have thought through these things and it's the same with if you want a career in, in filmmaking and we hadn't thought that through now we got lucky in that while we were on the film festival circuit the producer steve Lowe and i wrote a script that's a really really great script there's another company that's looking at it right now who might try to finance it this fall. Oh, nice. Which would be very cool. And Steve and I would be attached to direct it, which I'll probably talk about at the end. Uh, <laughs> I meander a lot. Um, no, that's fine. But that script got us an agent and a manager. And then for the next five or six years, we were in Hollywood working as writers, which was really cool. But the problem is that although we had many successes, none of the films ever got made. Mm. So I'm still doing the sound editing. I'm still writing. But – the films I was writing script after script and none of them got made years ago. I went, you know what? I need to just get back to filmmaking because this wasn't exactly the plan I made. For yourself, thought, made. But- I mean, it was, it, I'm not, not, it was fun writing these scripts and, and working with big name producers. And it was a lot of fun, but the days of huge advances were gone. So I wasn't making enough money to just chill on a beach afterwards. Mm-hmm. And the films weren't getting made. So I was like, okay, it's time to go back to my roots and start making films again with a plan and form a production company and get back into it that way. And the other things can still happen at the same time. Uh, that leads to Virtually. Right. Just go ahead and talk about Virtually. Yeah. So uh, Virtually is, I call it a romantic science fiction film. It's about a, a woman who's surviving alone in what we discover is basically a post-apocalyptic desert you know, a world with no water and everything above ground is poison and kind of living a nomadic lifestyle. And she, she one day comes across this old uh, farm and the only thing left standing there is this shed and she's exploring, looking for supplies, whatever. And in the shed, she discovers this old by the future standards, virtual reality machine that has a helmet and suit that allows you to, to do a full immersive VR experience. And the only thing left on the machine that works is a demo program, which is a short, 
uh, loop on a, of a sunset on a beach. And, of course, she's never seen a beach and she's never seen water mm-hmm. before. So for her, it's fascinating. And she basically begins living more in this virtual reality world than in the real world and uh, eventually falls in love with one of the characters inside the VR world. And uh, she ends up having to make the decision, does she want to live alone in the real world or die you know, in the arms of the person she loves in the fake world? Uh, so the film basically is commenting on what does it mean to live? You know, is is living alone a real life? I watched it and it's really great. And it actually reminded me. And I'm sure you've gotten this a lot, but it could be an episode of Black Mirror. Yeah, there is an episode of Black Mirror, I believe, where when people die, they can move into a virtual reality world. And there's an episode where uh, two women fall in love. In, yeah, in the world, in the Jupiter, and, yeah, Jupiter. and they're still alive. You know, they haven't died yet in the real world. They're both like old ladies in the in the mm-hmm. in the real world. But not not that it, it seems like a Black Mirror's episode. For me, it could be a Black yes, Mirror's episode. Yeah. And in fact, is, one of the things we'll be looking into because it's the length with commercial breaks. It's a half an hour mm-hmm. length. Is you know with these anthology shows going on, I think it would be a great standalone episode in one of these. I mean, Black Mirror does feature length, but there's some right. new ones coming out now that are that are yeah, half hour like, anthologies. The Twilight Zone is CB All Access, and there's like yeah. Oh, yeah, other anthology series. Yeah. That. So that's one of the things we'll be looking into for it. You know, Black Mirror really does at its even though it can be very creepy, and weird <laughs> at its heart. It's and about depressing and, and depressing. <laughs> at its heart, it's about humanity yeah. and the good and bad, and often mm-hmm. a lot of the bad yeah. <laughs> in humanity. Um, now, where did you get the idea for this? And how long did it take you to write it and then finally finish it? So once I decided that I was going to get back into filmmaking, you know, and make my own film as opposed to just writing scripts for other people, um, my first thought was, okay, what do I want to make? And although my main love has always been science fiction, you know, Star Wars is one of my earliest memories and I love, and especially the, the more allegorical, you know, Children of Men brilliant film oh, i love, love that film love that film from a technical standpoint but also just the themes again of it's kind of a quasi post-apocalyptic future and it, but again it's talking about what does it mean to be human when it comes right down to it i love those kind of movies i'd never written one or made one one of the first scripts i wrote was a science fiction script and it was really bad Every, i mean everybody's unless you're one of the one in a billion lucky people who just automatically write the best thing ever it was pretty bad. And not everyone could be Damien Chazelle, I guess. Yes, yeah, yeah. Not everybody yeah, <laughs> writes a script and then it's an the best Oscar script nominated. ever. Yeah, and, yeah, then it wins an Oscar. <laughs> Most of us mere mortals, our first scripts suck. And so I think I moved away from, from that because I didn't want to – I was such a fan. I didn't want to even have to read my own <laughs> <laughs> bad attempts at it. So I'd never done much in that genre, but it was my first love and st- I still love it. I was like, you know, I'm going to write a film that I would be a fan of yeah, or make. I'm going to make a film that as an audience member, I'd be like, oh, wow, what a great film. So that was the first thing, you know, be a fan of my own work, especially when you're working as a job. If you're not making money, and especially if you're a beginning filmmaker, be a fan of your own work. If you can't like your own work, no one else is going <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> like <laughs> to like your own work. I remember I was walking through a hallway at work and the image of a woman alone in the desert popped into my mind. Hmm. Um, and I went, okay, okay, well, cool. That's a cool image to start with. And it's in my budget because <laughs> <Right. laughs> it's a woman alone in the desert that I can accomplish. I can, I can make that happen. Uh, and then I just free associated, like, I don't know, is she in an alien world? Is she on our world? Is it the future? Is it far? Into, you know, so I just slowly pieced together that she's living alone at the time in 2016, not to get too political, suddenly post-apocalyptic things seemed more likely again compared to (laughs) in the past. Maybe that was playing on my mind. The uncertainty of the future of our country and our world. I'll let everybody else fill in the blanks there. But suddenly that seemed like uh, a reasonable fear again. And out of that, I'm like, well, I didn't want to do like a Mad Max type thing. Like I knew I wanted to do something that was smaller and more, not say emotional, but a little bit more intimate look into the future. And then I realized, okay, this woman's alone. Is that really living? And then I was like, oh, how could I show that living alone like that is horrible? And, and then I came up with the idea of she finds a virtual reality thing. And once I pieced the story together, I didn't know how it was going to end. I didn't know that ending. I didn't even know that it was a demo program that's only a short little loop mm-hmm. uh, until after I started writing it. 
I knew the setting. You got the basics of the concept yeah. and where you started writing. And I knew she was going to fall in love with someone in a fake world and have to decide. And then I discovered the rest of it. I wrote it. And I wrote it quick. I think less than a week. Oh, wow. Yeah. Now, that was three Draft years ago. That was three years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it took from the point where the script was, the first draft was done. And I was like, okay, I think I can raise enough money maybe to do this. Because, you know, then I had to go back. I wrote it just writing it. And then I'd go back and go, now, can I pull this off? Because that initial just a woman out in the desert by herself had morphed into the shed and the VR and a suit and a beach and and all this stuff. And there was even some other details that in rewrites got taken out that would be more challenging. But once I decided I was going to do it, it took two and a half years. From the point where I said, okay, I'm going to make it till we had the cast and crew premiere screening of a finished film that's uh, awesome we used to have a sign on the front door of the when i worked for a small sound company that said good fast cheap pick any two you don't get <laughs> all three, three yeah. you don't get all three yeah. and uh when you're doing short films or any low budget filmmaking of any size generally cheap is automatic you know you have to choose cheap you don't get to you know <laughs> which means you got you, you choose good or fast and if you want to be successful, you got to pick good. Got so that means good. the one that you give up is fast. Mm-hmm. Which I think is a good compromise. Yeah. Now, there are people who, who will luck into a small contained great script that can be shot in one day. And everybody who's available happens to be available that day, you know, that they want. And the they knock it out. Align. Yes, everything. <laughs> the weather's great. You know, no one runs out of gas. There's on their no way to airplanes set. overhead. <laughs> Precisely. Air, no airplanes. The edit is quick. They don't have to do any reshoots, you know. Uh, they don't have to do any test screenings and figure out what's not working in the story, and it's all like perfect. And the entire film is done and released in three weeks. But that's usually not the case. <laughs> usually, you got to work hard. Right. So let's go ahead and play the trailer for virtually. When I was little, my mom told me stories about a soft world, a connected world. One story I knew had to be a lie was that once upon a time you could visit a place called the beach, which touched something called an ocean. A place with so much water that you couldn't see land on the other side. But in the real world, there is no ocean, no connection. No help. You are on your own. Welcome to the virtually AK three sixty demo initiated. The water's beautiful, isn't it? Hi, I'm Nate. So how did you find your cast and crew? And any tips on finding cast and crew? Yeah, um, use social media now. (laughs) It's great. It's so much better. Um, Now, in my case... I've been in LA a long time. I've been working here a long time. So I had a pretty deep pool to pull from. So I was lucky. In my personal case, when I, once I decided to make this movie, I wanted as much as possible to work with people I'd either already worked with or knew who were friends and make it a kind of family event. So the producer is my wife. She'd never produced any of my stuff before, but she's always been on set and she's really smart and I could trust her. <laughs> <laughs> and She was, you know, wanting to get into filmmaking. I was like, okay, you're going to produce this next film. And our kids were old enough that she didn't have to take care of them anymore. (laughs) Yeah, because when I did Pope Dreams, we filmed a lot of it at my house. So she literally moved out with the kids (laughs) 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 while we took over the house and filmed. But now, uh, so my wife produced it, did an amazing job. After I talked to her, the very next person I went to was uh, Chris, the director of photography. He was actually the best boy electric on Pope Dreams and had after Pope Dreams gone to AFI for cinematography and is a really amazing cinematographer, really talented. And it was a case of, you know, had I been a stranger 
for the money I was offering and the stuff. I don't know if I would have got them, <laughs> but I gave him the script and he got right away what, what I was going for. And we had our first meeting and right away we're talking about the use of camera movement and color and how we're going to contrast the two worlds. And, and like he got right away visually how we're going to help reinforce the story. So he came on board and then, you know, a lot of the people, the production designer, Danny, who did a, awesome job that in the interior of that shed when you look at the trailer um in the movie that shed is real on a western set that we found but the inside is is empty so she designed all that she made the virtual reality machine she made that helmet and the suit um, oh that's awesome and all that stuff that none of that was like bought in a store or bought from a prop house she designed all that stuff herself and i'm not even going to say how little money i gave her to make it because <laughs> i want her to get a bigger budget on the next time so i don't want people to think she can pull that off every time for <laughs> how little money um, i gave her to work with but she she did miracles but so she again uh, a friend of mine who's also a sound editor and filmmaker recommended her to me he had, she had worked on uh, a couple of his films um, she built an entire prison in his garage for what? a prison film, That's awesome. you know, with the cells, you know, the, the jail right, cells the and stuff, and the bars and stuff. Uh, so again, a personal uh, referral. The composer is the most classic Hollywood story of all. How you <laughs> never know. I go to a church in Canoga Park, and the pianist who plays the accompaniment music at the services is just this, the nicest woman, and she she no longer plays there anymore. But a couple years ago, while she was still playing there. I'm standing there talking with someone about how I'm going to make this film and I'm in pre-production on it. And she's standing next to me talking to someone else and she's talking about how she's about to do the score for another short film. <laughs> and I kind of caught <laughs> – Talking about filmmaking. Talking about filmmaking. <laughs> and it turns out, it turns out the, 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 the young lady who was playing piano at our church is an incredibly talented composer. She's the in-house composer for Five Alarm Music. She was doing this just on the side to make a little extra cash because she was getting ready to start a family and, and wanted to put away a little extra money. She's been a Sundance Composing Lab fellow and gone up to uh, Skywalker Sound and spent wow. weeks. And this year she's a um, a fellow for the ASCAP Women in Film Composing. Like she's really, really good. And she's been sitting there not 10 feet from me playing the <laughs> piano every Sunday for years. So when I found – when I – heard her say that i go oh you know what's your you know and she gave me her website and oftentimes you don't know what you're going to get mm -hmm. but then i went to her website and i'm like oh my goodness she's so good so that's how i got the composer <laughs> <laughs> uh and then for the actors uh again for the last couple seasons i was the sound supervisor for the tv show vampire diaries uh -huh. and the final season the villain was the devil the actual little devil mm -hmm. and it was uh, played by this actor named Wale parks and when they cast him and, and started filming, they thought, well, the devil never has to raise his voice because he's a devil. Everybody listens to him, right? Mm -hmm. It's like E.F. Hutton, right? Everybody stops and listens when the devil speaks. So they had him speak very quietly. So everything he said was like this when he's talking. Then when they cut the show together, they're like, oh, this doesn't work. We gave him the wrong note. We need him to come in and redo all of his lines in ADR, which – if you know anything about actors, they hate ADR. ADR. <laughs> and I was really dreading going into this room because, of course, the producers decide they have to do it. They're not there when right. we actually do the ADR. Right. It's me sitting there having to tell them. I was like, wait, you're going to tell them ahead of time, right? Now, I'm not telling them that he's redoing all of his lines. But he came in and he was so awesome about it. He was like, okay, I got it. They realized the note's wrong. You know, It would have been great if they fixed it before we started filming, but <laughs> let's make this awesome. And he worked his butt off doing the ADR. And I was like, boy, I want to work with this guy because he's like so awesome. awesome. His attitude is exactly what you want. You know, I was just a sound guy. But as a director, I want I, if that's the attitude he has here when nobody of importance is around, then he has definitely has that attitude when he's on set with the producers and the directors and all the other people. So I think I just – Very important you know, to know then in Hollywood, you should always be cool and nice to every single person on – yeah. Sunset. Well, because like, you so, never know what they will lead to in the future. Precisely. So the PA on my film, Pope Dreams, uh, the head PA, just out of film school, super talented. Her name's Callie Miller. Even on Pope Dreams, we could tell she was head PA because she was the most on top of it. She's now just finished being the associate producer of the TV show Criminal Minds. Wow. So if I was doing the sound on that show, she would have been my boss. So <laughs> right. That's, that's so. That you just never know. Uh, yeah, you just never know. You never know. 
even on set, the actor from Pope Dreams, he then did a pilot. It didn't get picked up, but he was a co-lead on this pilot. It starred Tom Berenger. Didn't oh, go, wow. so he never saw it. But so he was, a, you know, no one knew who Philip was yet. And, but he was like third or fourth lead on the pilot. And they were shooting the very, very first day of filming was a bar scene. And the assistant director came up to Philip and said, hey, Philip, do you mind, we're pre-lighting, do you mind standing at your position for your first scene? Normally they don't, they have stand-ins for all mm-hmm. this, but it's a pilot and Philip was young and Phillips, and they were really apologetic, like, do you mind? Because if he said no, they would have been fine with him. He goes, no, I'll stand there and do it. So Philip is standing at the bar while they're pre-lighting. And one of the background performers, what we used to call extras, they're now, mm-hmm. was standing there as well. And he said to, to Philip, trying to throw his weight around because he was one of the more experienced background artists, he said, can you go get me a bottle of water from the, from the cooler? And Philip said, no, I think we're supposed to, you know, they're pre-lighting. We can't move yet. Cause they're, you know, setting up the lights and that would mess them up. And he basically, I, I think he, he, I, he probably didn't say it as politely as this. He goes, he said, basically, don't be a jerk, but I don't think he said jerk. Wow. <laughs> he said, don't be a jerk. Go get me a bottle of water, man. As the assistant director was walking by and the AD turned to this guy and said, did you just tell the star of the show to not be a blankety blank? <laughs> 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 apparently the guy's face turned white and. The AD said, you can go get your check and you know, we're done with your services. Thank you very much. Wow. So you never know who's who. <laughs> Just be polite to everybody. <laughs> Jeez. But Jeez. Uh, so yeah, so um go I, gave, to I gave Wale the script once I was finished with it and I said, Hey, would you play Nate? And he was like, Yeah, I love the script, sounds great. And then I did the same thing. There was an actress um who'd worked on a show and I, because she said no, I'm not gonna name her, but she's super nice. And she read the script and wanted to do it. And we were all set with her. So we were getting ready to start moving forward with the crowdfunding and everything. I had my two actors, um, everything was set. And then she realized that she and her husband were going to make a short film about half a year after mine. And they wanted to crowdfund it. And she realized, Ooh, I don't want to be involved with two crowdfunding back to back, back to back and steal from my project. So she had to back out, which I totally understand. It's like, I I totally get that. But everything came to a stop. (laughs) So we were literally about to get going and now we don't have the lead. So again, I... I Did that delay things? Yeah, that delayed things, yeah. So I reached out again. Uh, So this was like October of 2016 and we come to a stop. So then I start reaching out to friends again. And a friend of mine, who also, oddly enough, is another sound editor slash filmmaker, <laughs> recommended uh, an actress. And then two other actresses were were recommended to me. So rather than doing just like a cold call audition type read the script, instead I just met with these three actresses and had lunch after they'd read the script and we discussed it. And one of the things I recommend in casting, even if you're doing a traditional casting, I think it's important to talk to the actor about the character in the film and get – whether or not they get what you're going for because there's the technical acting part, like can they act, which you learn from having them read the pages. But then there's, do they get what you're going for and can they elevate it beyond just saying the words in a, you know, in the right tone into, can they convey through their eyes what's really going on? And if they're not getting what the script's about, then you're in trouble. Right. And two of the actors, clearly got it and one didn't. So that kind of whittered it down to two. Mm -hmm. And then in the end, I think they're both great actresses and they both had a lot of success. And I basically just, I went with the one who I thought was more going to embody the character, but they both got, it It was a tough, it was so tough because they both like, they both got it. They were both on board and they were both very talented. And I went with the one that I thought was a more versatile actress. Another thing, and I think, when you do actual traditional casting is even if the actor comes in and has great instincts and reads the part right the way you imagined it, give them some notes and directions and see if they can follow it. Yeah. Follow it. Can they follow it? And can they deliver on short notice with changes? Because when you're on set, sometimes an actor will just say the line the wrong way and you have to be able to quickly, everybody's sitting there and you know, you're literally burning money waiting there. You have to give them notes if they can quickly change. When I cast Pope dreams, the young actress who was cast as the female lead, 
was given the wrong information by her manager when she showed up for her audition. So she showed up like as this like rocker chick with like an ACDC t-shirt and her hair teased out. Mm. Like she's hanging out at the clubs every weekend trying to be a groupie. The character is a freshman at Stanford who's, you know, <laughs> saying, yeah, like she like, you know, <laughs> so she goes to the club because she's not supposed to go to the club to make her dad upset. But so she came in totally wrong and she was like, oh my God. And I said, well, so I gave her some notes and she flipped it and got like 99% of the way there, like right there with no prep. And I was very impressed. I was like, okay, good. I know she can act and she can take direction and make it her own. And it worked out really well because on set, she had a lot of scenes where I'd have to kind of talk to her about it. And she did a great job. That's awesome. Talk about working in the location of the desert and then the location of where they were at the beach. I'm assuming the beach part was CGI. Yeah, that was green screen. Right. Yeah. So, which I thought I really wanted to really film on a beach. I wanted the VR to seem even more real than <laughs> than the uh, uh, the shed. But the producer and DP talked me off that ledge. Thankfully, <laughs> <laughs> they pointed out for those who haven't seen the film, it's always sunset on the beach. Right. It isn't normal because it's virtual reality. So the sun's always setting on the beach. So the amount of equipment and manpower it would have taken to duplicate a sunset on a real beach all day. Cause we can't just show up for 30 minutes every day <laughs> to film. We had to be there all day. It would have been tough plus sound and wind and the elements and everything. <laughs> so they talked about that. So filming in the desert, the first six minutes of the movie has no dialogue. Mm-hmm. Which, now, really which like. desert did you film in? So the close ups were all filmed actually in Corganville State Park in Simi Valley. Oh, okay. If the camera pans to the left or the right, huge housing developments. <laughs> um, so those are the close-ups. The wide drone shots are actually up in Red Rock Canyon State Park north of Edwards Air Force Base, like halfway between here and Vegas. Oh, okay. And that's actually my daughter in the Bixby suit. Oh, um, really? Yeah, yeah, the actress wasn't available that day, but it was the perfect day to go. And I knew it was going to be horrible suffering because it was like 100 degrees. So <laughs> You put your daughter in it. <laughs> so I my, made my daughter do it. We brought a huge cooler of water. <laughs> and we took many breaks. And it was very safe. No one was ever in any danger. Uh, so you that follow was, the laws and protocols of everything, I'm yeah. sure. <laughs> that was the uh, the wide shots in the desert. That Red Rock Canyon State Park has that look. It's great. It, it's it has those look. striated rock cliffs mm-hmm. and stuff. You know, Everybody goes to Vasquez Rocks, and that's great and everything, but – there are certain things when you look at it, well, that's just, you know, we're a mile out of L.A. This clearly was we're not in downtown L.A. or like the close-ups. The and Vasquez close-ups. Rocks, you just – now it's just become used so many yeah. times that you know, oh, that's Vasquez Rocks. Yeah. And, and again, Simi Valley Park worked for the close-ups. But had we gone wide, that would not have looked like mm-hmm. anything extraordinary. And so Red Rock Canyon State Park was the one place we could get to in one day's travel there and back. That had that look without having to go like out of state to like Arizona or someplace, which if I had more money, I frankly would have. But I just needed a taste of it because it's not about that. The movie's not about I just needed a taste. So I had to – the compromise was find a place where I could get a couple shots. Mm-hmm. If I needed 10, 20, 30 shots, I would have had to have gone further away. But that was that. And then the actual shed is part of a, a Wild West set outside Landers, California, just north of Joshua Tree. The reason we only show the shed from that angle is if we turned around and filmed the other direction, there's an entire practical Western set. Oh, no, really? Westerns. <laughs> I loved it so much, I now want to do a sci fi Western to film <laughs> the, at, the rest, at the rest of the set. Um, but it, you're like, it's, you know, it's 6,000 feet or so. You're up in the high desert. So it gets cold. And we filmed it in January. And we went the week before for the tech scout, and it was like 70 and beautiful. And we weren't paying attention. The day before we filmed, it was like a high of 68. And then a storm moved in overnight. And the day we filmed, the high was like 40. And wow. the wind, all that wind you see, everything rippling and blowing, which looks great on camera. camera. That's real wind. <laughs> and it was with wind chill, it was about 30 degrees out. And we were all freezing. Wow. We actually sent a PA to the dollar store to buy the little cheap gloves for everybody on set because not everybody... But they weren't prepared, weren't prepared. for it. Yeah. Our DP was prepared because he's a pro. He, <laughs> he went to his car and pulled out like a parka and thick gloves and a knit hat. And everybody else was like, we hate you. It's like, well, that's that's why he's the pro <laughs> who usually makes a lot more money than this. Uh, and we're not because he knows the real deal, which is to come prepared. He probably had a swimsuit back there just in case it went the other way. So the challenge was 
was the weather. We had to change her wardrobe got changed a little bit for the scenes in the shed because it was just too cold. There was a safety issue of we didn't want her to freeze to death. And we even found an old propane heater, like an old school heater. Mm -hmm. And we brought it in and set it up, but then we saw that it had an, actually an open, exposed flame. Ooh. And we had a we had a, we had a quick little powwow, and the DP was like, "That's not safe." And I'm like, "Yeah, you're right." So I had to go to the actress and say, "I'm really sorry, but we have to." So we kept her out of the shed as much as possible by that propane heater, but offset where it was safe. She had her coat on until the like it was like roll sound, roll camera, remove jacket, <laughs> action. <laughs> but what was nice is because there's no dialogue. We didn't have to worry about the sound at the location. Mm -hmm. But one time you don't have to worry about sound. And, you know, we could call out directions and, you know, all that kind of stuff without having to worry about it. At the green screen stage, it was like all dialogue because right. they're always talking for the most part. And we had to be careful about sound. The stage, within our budget, we got a great stage. It was a little too close to the roads for my liking. So there's a lot of ADR still in the movie because you can't be in a VR secluded sunset on a beach and then hear a truck roll by <laughs> outside. Um, and we didn't have time to blow takes because of the trucks. So I was like, you know what? We're just going to go and get a scratch track. And if I have to loop it, I'll, I knew both of these actors were really good at ADR and that helps having right, that experience. Yeah. <laughs> Had I not known that Wole was so awesome with ADR and so good about it and Katie too, I might've, tried to stop production and try to get, but I knew I had the, that as a safety. Plus I knew I had the access to it. Not all filmmakers have. So I'm, I was lucky in that regard. Out in the desert, it was much more about getting the visuals right. And then in the green screen, like it's green screen. So there's not much. I let Chris were the DP worry about lighting it properly for green screen. And I just focused on trying to get the performance and giving them notes. And, and the other problem we has, we didn't have the budget for on, on the bigger budget films. They have, what they call distro, audio distro. So everybody has headsets and here's what's being mic'd. We didn't have that. <laughs> so the script supervisor and I, you know, would try to sit as close as possible. But when they're having these quite intimate conversations on this giant soundstage, it was oftentimes hard for us <laughs> to hear the dialogue. So oftentimes I'd have to like afterwards go to the actors and say, so did you say this line? Did you do like, like how was that? Make sure. <laughs> Make sure. <laughs> so I'm oftentimes just watching their face on a monitor, but I couldn't hear what they were. It's the limitation of the budget, right? All the everybody means, but... with wireless headphones listening in. Talk about the limited budget. How did you get the budget for it virtually? Did you caught fun? You were saying, mm -hmm. did you have any investors? Talk about fundraising. So no investors. I had investors for Pope Dreams, and they were really great. But if it's an investor, you have to answer to the investor. Right. But doing a short film, it was an expensive short film, even though it's a small one because of the story. There were certain things we had to do. You know, we had to shoot on a green screen stage, and it had to be big enough. We had to pay for it. The shed was perfect. The exterior of that shed that you see in the movie is basically how we found it. Like we didn't set dress the exterior. It was exactly what we needed. We did film a couple exterior scenes there as well. It worked great. But again, it's a professional set we had to pay for. So we mm -hmm. had to pay for the locations. But it's it's money well spent. You know, On a short film, you want to make sure your money is on the screen. Mm -hmm. We paid a lot for the locations, but that pays off in the, the look of the film. You can tell this isn't like two guys filming Lord of the Rings in their basement. Trying to, you know. <laughs> so we didn't do investor side. So I, I decided a combination of crowdfund and pull favors, getting that you can't pull favors every single time. Right. Because I was kind of starting over again here after this break and was making films. I'm like, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to pull in some favors. And then I was like, okay, this crowdfunding thing seems pretty cool. So I did a lot of research. There's pros and cons to every site. You know, there's Kickstarter, there's Indiegogo, then there's a couple dedicated, and one of them is Seed and Spark. Seed and Spark, yeah. And I went with Seed and Spark. Partly, I just wanted to support it and try to help it. And I also liked that Can you talk dedicated. more about Seed and Spark? Because I know about it, too. I had friends that have used it. But can you uh, talk about it more? Yeah, Seed and Spark. I mean, basically, it's Kickstarter, but only for indie film. That's all it has. It doesn't do anything else. Uh, whether it's documentary or narrative, short feature, it's just... Indie film, and it also can be for the entire film or for phases of a film. So, like a bigger feature film might do a crowdfunding for you know finishing costs or just for pre production to try to create a trailer. But what I liked about it, they also do streaming on it. So, if you fund through Seed and Spark, you can choose to distribute the film on Seed and Spark. So, in addition to just being a patron who 
looks and finds films that you like and give money to them. You can also pay a very small less than, I think it's like four or five dollars a month and watch any of the films that got made through Seed and Spark that agree to stream on it. So you can watch indie films mm-hmm. there as well. That's so it's awesome. all about all about indie film. Now, um, I think also like if you can donate money, but you are like a hairstylist or makeup, you could volunteer your time. As yeah. Well. So you can you can set up your your crowdfunding not just for for, for cash, mm-hmm. but for items or services. And one of the items can be you know a camera package, and maybe there's a DP out there who's like, wow, I love this project. I want to be a part of it. I'm going to donate myself and my camera package to the or yeah to the yeah, project yeah to the project so it's 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 not just cash it works the same as kickstarter in that you offer rewards mm-hmm. for participation and the other thing that's nice about them is, is they create a mailing list for you and they have a built-in app in the thing that allows you to email all of the people who either donated or signed up just to follow your project so you instantly have an email uh, uh, like a mailing list of all the people who were involved so you can keep them update on production and where it's filming and where it's screening and what successes it's had and where it's getting distributed and so on. It also, uh, uh, you don't have to, but it it was started by women and it's focused on getting more women and minorities in filmmaking and stresses that and has rewards for that. So I think that's cool that it's trying to open up filmmaking, you know, Kickstarter is just blind, right? It's like anyone, anyone, um, this is, this says, you know, look, if you can bring more women and minority on board, your project will help it more. And they also, unlike Kickstarter, they review every project, project before it goes live and offer suggestions on things you could do to tweak it and adjust it to make it more successful. So they kind of help you out. Oh, that's awesome. And then the last thing is I think Kickstarter is all or nothing and any go, go is you get whatever you get. Yeah. So seed and spark well, is in between. Well, any go, go is you get 10%. If you don't meet your goal, and they take four percent if you do meet your goal. Oh, I see, I see. But yeah. Okay, they take. So, so seed and spark is if you make eighty percent of your goal. They don't change how much they take out. So, in other words, if you don't make eighty percent, then it goes away because what they don't want is for people to donate money to things that never happen. They want they want trust in their audience uh-huh. that if you donate to a film, odds are it's going to actually get made like if they take your money you know you're more likely to see a finished thing kickstarter you know or indiegogo especially you give money and you never know what you're gonna get Mm -hmm. and then they figured that you know even if you don't raise 100 percent of your budget if you get at least 80 percent, you can probably then cut some Mm -hmm. things out of the budget and still make the film Mm -hmm. so i like that approach plus it then forces the filmmakers to really work it hard you know you have to hit that goal and it requires that you that everybody who is on there kind of puts up a realistic goal like you can't just throw up i'm raising a quarter of a million dollars <laughs> yeah you know even though you only need 20,000 you have to think logically about what your real needs are so i I'll went be with creative with it nice so in using that you've also entered some film festivals um we want to talk about the process of entering your film and film festivals and all the awards you've gotten from virtually and the festival sure. circuit. So, I mean, everybody's strategy is different. I think the the only strategy that's not good is just applying to every film festival you see are independently wealthy and have that kind of money <laughs> uh, or not putting any thought into it and just applying to like the ones you've heard of. I think the best strategy personally for applying to film festivals that I've tried to use, my uh, my oldest is now in college, my oldest daughter. And what they do now with the kids in high school is they say they call the three-tier system. Come up with three tiers if you're applying to college. The dream schools, the good fit, and the fallbacks. And I think in, in applying to film festivals, you might want to try the same approach, which is everybody wants to apply to Sundance. Everybody wants to apply to Tribeca. Everybody wants to apply to Toronto. And I applied to two of three of those. <laughs> and, and one said no, and I haven't heard from the other yet. I'll let you guess the rest. But you, you know, those are the, the pie in the sky. You're one of 10,000 films and you just have to cross your fingers that somehow not only do the judges who get assigned your film really dig it, but they just happen to have a showcase of – if there's a short film, a block of films tied around a theme that your film is perfect for. To get into one of those films, it has to be a perfect fit because there are a thousand other films that you're competing against right. for that slot with that theme, et cetera. So I think applying to some of those – it's good and it's fun to think you might get into them. And if you can, you know, you won't get in if you don't apply. So I think you want to apply to some of those. Mm-hmm. 
But then you really want to focus on that middle tier, which are the the good fit. To put it in perspective, you know, I would say we're getting accepted into about one out of every five of the general film festivals that we're applying to. Big, small, little, across the board, just that are general film festivals that don't have a theme. One out of five. And where are you applying? Like, where do you find them to apply for? I do a lot of online research. Movie Maker Magazine lists, you know, the, the best film festivals, both just like the coolest, the best for short films, the best for feature films, the best for documentary, the best for, you know, they have different lists. I do a lot of that. And then there's, you know, Without a Box used to be the biggest online site for automatically applying to film festivals where the film festivals work with Without a Box. So you just put up all your information Without a Box. And then you play the festival. You don't have to refill out all the forms and all the links to every mm-hmm. festival. You just do it one time on Without a Box, and then it just goes. But I, Without a Box is closing. I found that out right as I was beginning the festival. No. Circuit, yeah. <laughs> so I, there's another one that's actually kind of become the go-to one now called Film Freeway. Mm-hmm. And that's the one I've used almost exclusively. So if I find a festival that doesn't use Film Freeway, that is a specific festival I want to get into, then I go with whatever they – say whether it's their own site or without a box, whatever. But when I'm just generally looking for festivals that fit what I'm looking for, I go to Film Freeway because it's you have limited time to do this and the fact that I don't have to fill out all the stuff over and over again. And they're smart because I probably have spent more money on film festivals than I would have otherwise simply because I don't have to spend all the right. time. So it's, it can be dangerous. you got to be careful. You, have, you still have to have a plan because if you just haphazardly – find up festivals on Film Freeway. They make it very easy to apply. And the next thing you know, you just spent $1,000 on film festival submissions. And you're like, whoa, what? where did all my money go? <laughs> um, but that mid-tier, that middle tier, you know, you want to find what is my film. Good film is a given. Everybody wants a good film, right? So what does my film have that differentiates it from all the other films? And are there festivals that are looking for that? So in my case, science fiction. So I've applied to a lot more science fiction, fantasy type film festivals as a percentage wise in any other kind of festival. And in those festivals, I'm, I'm batting more about 40, 50%. And of the ones I get in, I'm winning awards in about 70, 75% of them. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm providing them the kind of film that they want. The third tier for me, the ones that you've always wanted to go there, the festival that's in Miami. I was like, I've never been to Miami. I'm going to play in Miami. I want to go to Miami. <laughs> <laughs> you know, or, you know, I have family in such and such a place. So, you know, you apply to some that just for a personal, like it may not be anything that will help your film, but it would just be a fun experience. You know, you only live once, travel, get to go places. And if you can do it with your film, even better. So we've done really well. We've won seven best film awards. Most of them have been at genre festivals, science fiction or science fiction horror mm-hmm. festivals. Uh, we won one Best Director Award, which, yeah, which I'm very rec- proud of. recently won uh, right before Memorial Weekend, right? Y- yeah. So, uh, so congrats on that. Thank you. And then a couple Best Acting Awards, which I think are very uh, well-deserved. And then we just picked up our first foreign awards. We picked up uh, uh, the Best Sci-Fi Horror Mystery was our category at a German film festival and uh, Best Sci-Fi Short at a Japanese genre festival. And then we'll find out that festival is like, you know, they pick winners and then the winners compete to actually screen. So you have to <laughs> – they only do one screening of like the, the top films of the year. Oh, wow. So it's a little bit harder. But it was a genre festival. So we've we've had a lot of success in that area and we're playing in a couple really nice – what I call big, small. Small festivals that are big in their area that aren't genre at the end of next month. And that's very exciting to get a chance to – to play at festivals like that. But I love the genre festivals because the people there, the audiences and the other filmmakers, it's like basically all the geeks of that particular genre all together. And so there's a different energy because they're all unabashedly just huge fans. Right. Like some film festivals, but everybody tries to play it cool, right? Like mm-hmm. I'm too cool to just gush and ooh and over <laughs> stuff. But at genre festivals, everybody there is like, I'm a geek and I'm proud and mm-hmm. I love this stuff. Yeah, it seems like the ones that I would be going to... <laughs> Yeah, I'm saying looking at the at the posters on the wall here <laughs> in your studio, you would love some of those genre festivals. So any last minute advice you'd like to give any listeners about the process of filmmaking? Anything that you've learned that you wish you would – knowing now what you wish you would have known then? Budget a lot for craft services. Everybody <laughs> eats a lot and a fed crew is a happy crew. That's rule number one. If you're the director, 
on whatever budget film, your job is the vision of the film. And the goal isn't to keep everybody else from putting their stamp on the film, but to find out what their ideas are and find out how their ideas can support that vision and then let them do their, their thing. I think a lot of filmmakers, especially at the beginning levels, don't pay attention to things like production design, costume. Those things matter a lot in a film. And yes, you can have a scene in an empty room and it can be great and the emotion be great. But when the production design is there to reinforce it and subtly impact the emotion of the scene, it's that much better. We're talking about uh, Damien Chazelle earlier. Um, mm-hmm. I saw the the short he made for Whiplash that he used to get the funding. And they filmed it in a typical music room, which is White Walls. And it's a nice little scene. But then when they actually filmed it, um, production design got rid of those White Walls. And the walls are like, if you recall, they're like a dark gray right. or black. And there's an oppressiveness. So when he's hammering into that guy and yelling at him, there isn't this light, bright aura around him of these white walls it's like dark, dark and like really oppressive and you feel this kid like just getting beat down by this guy and it's the same actor same acting but the production design help leads to the oppressiveness that this guy and pushes down on all these kids so if you get these people on board with you they'll make your film better so don't be afraid to solicit ideas from all the other people. I always say that a good director steals everybody's best ideas on set <laughs> and uses them for their own. But what I mean by that is is you lead them in the right direction and then you let them do their thing. I would hope that the cinematographer I've hired on my film is a better cinematographer than me. If he's not better than me, I'm in trouble. Right. The actors better be better actors than me or I'm in trouble. Production designer better have better sense of how to design stuff than me. But what you do as a, as a filmmaker, director is you're trying to make sure that they're headed in the direction that you want. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to lead them in that vision. And that's the main thing. So that that's one half of directing. The other thing I didn't realize when I started was how much, when you get to features, the problem with shorts, it's, it doesn't come up as much. But when I did my first feature, I didn't realize how much as a director with the actors, your job is to remind them where they are because you usually film completely out of sequence. Very few films film and sequence right so for pope dreams there's a romance there's a relationship story between the two young leads the first day of filming in the entire film we filmed their first date then at about the midpoint of the film we filmed the ending where they the relationship comes to an end and then on the very last day of filming we filmed the scene where they meet for the first time and everything in between there was all over the place. <laughs> all over the place, yeah. So one of the things I, I hadn't really thought about till I was there on set was how important it was for me to really know the material, the script, and have written out notes on each scene for the actors so that I could, before we started filming each of those scenes, remind them of what happened before, like where we came from before. Because oftentimes we hadn't filmed the prior scene. So I had to remind them, okay, okay, in the last scene, you guys were fighting and and it was left, you know, and remind them kind of where they were so that when we then cut the film together, the continuity of their performance was right. And you don't really ever notice on a short film, if it's just a short film that's a five-minute film, you don't usually have that kind of problem because you don't have time for those kind of arcs. And it was something that I, I hadn't thought about. So Actually, that's that's funny. I think you're the first person there to mention that in there. In all of our interviews. <laughs> yeah. So that's great. Yeah. Oh, and one more thing as a director, have the right notes to give your actors direction because that's your job mm-hmm. uh, above all else is to give the actors direction. I studied in USC. I learned with a, a, an actress named Nina Foch, and she was great about giving actors actions instead of feelings. You know, telling an actor, be more sad. Well, what the right. hell, you know, some people cry when they're sad. Some people get quiet when they're sad. Some people yell when they're sad. You know, sad doesn't give me an action to do, you know. So giving actual actions, mm-hmm. you know, if you say hurt him to the actress, okay, she can come up with a way to hurt him. Mm-hmm. You know, it may not be the way you would do it, but it's the way she would do it and it'll be more real. Um, if you just say, you know, be angry. And then the other, the other thing I learned. so vague. Yeah. Give, give action. Actors like actions. Mm-hmm. Give them actions. Even if it ends up having to be a very basic thing like be louder or be softer. An mm-hmm. actor can do that. If you say yell the line, they know what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. If you just say get angry, 
<laughs> that can go in whatever direction. And then the other thing I've learned, especially beginning filmmakers, since oftentimes you don't have access to Meryl Streep when you're, you know, and the actors maybe <laughs> say what? Yeah, I know. Shock. <laughs> Most of you guys out there, you're not going to get Meryl Streep in your first film <laughs> unless you're Damien. Uh, Chazelle. Chazelle. <laughs> Sometimes. Uh, simplifying if it's if the actor's a little green or a little over their head or nervous usually when they're insecure they'll try to do too much so simplifying it and giving them easy directions and bringing it down helps the performance so if it's a couple fighting you know the woman's supposed to say i hate you and the actress like breaks a vase and then like puts her hand dramatically to her head and pulls at her (laughs) hair and then says i hate you you know (laughs) They may think they're acting, but you're, you're like, oh. So if you just tell her, you know, don't – just look at them and say, I hate you. Now you have the same scene, right? And you cut to her and her eyes are just – now the audience would be like cold. But it's actually she's not doing anything. They're just flat and she goes, I hate you. Like that can cut much more, you know, mm-hmm. and that's more dramatic. And you don't have people cringing at, you know, the <laughs> subpar performance that you're getting. So simplifying sometimes on the low-budget films helps a lot. It goes, uh, goes a long way. Yeah. Awesome. And let's talk about some of your favorite films and which directors are your favorite as well. And if any have influenced you on your work. Yeah. So I actually brought my, I brought my list because I was. <laughs> <laughs> you you I, came prepared. I came, one time someone asked me what my favorite five films were and I was like, God, how do I. So I actually tried to type it up and I ended up with like 40 films. And then I was like, how do I <laughs> Edit this put down. one over the other, over the other. So I actually came up – I think I ended up with 11. Like my, my, my 10 favorite films are 10 most influential films and there's 11 of them. Uh, <laughs> see if you but, know. Um, but, um, uh, so Breaking Away. I don't know if you've ever seen that or not. Everybody calls it the Bicycle movie. Star, oh, okay. Dennis Quaid. They, yeah. Star Wars. Aliens. I watched Aliens a gazillion times when it came out. Uh, Big Trouble in Little China. One of the best uh, action comedies of all film. time. Uh, the Diving Bell and the Butterfly. Very small art film. If you haven't seen it, it's brilliant. True story of a, of a magazine editor who became paralyzed uh, and couldn't move anymore. Mm. Highlander, the original Highlander. Mm. There can only be um, one. Yep. The General, I think the greatest silent oh, film yeah. ever made with Buster Keaton. Yeah, Buster Keaton. Uh, Shawshank Redemption, which I – that's the show. The, the, the joke, what TV show or when, if you're scrolling the channels and a movie, <laughs> you come across a movie, what's the movie that you always stop for? Shawshank yeah. Redemption yeah. for me. Uh, Children I've, been, of Men. I've been late many times because of that film. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Children of Men, which I already mentioned. Uh, Almost Famous. Oh, yeah. Love Almost Famous. Yeah, Cameron Crowe. And then a very obscure film by the director Peter Weir called Picnic at Hanging Rock. It actually got remade last year about a true story about a group of women at an Australian boarding school who claimed to have been uh, abducted by aliens. Uh, those are some of the, the very eclectic <laughs> bunch of films but they're all films that made lasting impressions if you if you watch my movie pope dreams and then you watch breaking away you'll be like oh man you just ripped off everything <laughs> <laughs> i didn't do it on purpose <laughs> but the tone and a lot of the of the you know the relationships of the family especially and everything it's very much that kind reminiscent of, to that yeah reminiscent to that movie it was very uh and a lot of those directors are my favorites uh, i've always been a huge peter weir fan Dead Poet Society. Mm-hmm. I mean, oh my goodness. Gallipoli. I don't know if everybody's seen that one or not. I think that was one he made in Australia. It's an, it was one of uh, Mel Gibson's first movies. Movies, yeah. You know, great stuff. Even as bad movies are <laughs> still are good. Uh, Cameron Crowe uh, as Cameron well. Crow. When you talk about more modern movie making, you know, his stuff in the 80s really resonated mm-hmm. uh, with me. Catherine Bigelow for action because I don't want to say it's because she's a, a female filmmaker. But her action is way more intense and it gets you a lot. Like she's not about, look how cool this guy looks as he jumps sideways firing his two guns. She's more like, you know, this hurts. (laughs) You know, this this is not fun when you're fighting and it's very visceral and it feels more real. Some of the machismo of it is stripped away Mm -hmm. with her stuff. Uh, And her, her, you know, she did this great film called Near Dark. I Um, love Near Dark. Near Dark. And I love Point Break. Yeah, Point Break. Yeah, I mean we always – joke about Keanu Reeves skydiving, but it was yeah, a good film. It was, yeah, and it was, I didn't realize that she directed that film. I was pretty amazed. And then um, John Carpenter was my first, the first filmmaker where I really paid, like, attention. paid attention and got that here's a guy who has a style and a way of making films 
when it's a John Carpenter film, you know it's a John Carpenter film. Mm -hmm. Like a lot of people will go, well, I want to see a Tom Cruise movie. He was one of the directors where like, oh, it's a John Carpenter film. Oh, I'm in because I know like even again, his bad films still have the coolest stuff in them. Mm -hmm. When I first moved to L.A., I actually snuck onto the set of uh, Escape from L.A. (laughs) True true story. I I, I (laughs) found out they were filming at the Coliseum. And if you've seen the film, you know the scene yeah. where he's forced to yeah. shoot basketballs yeah. or they're going to kill him. I watched them film that scene. So I went – I found out they were filming at the Coliseum. So I went over and I saw this old guy walking around outside there on dinner break and it was one of the hairdressers. And I basically explained to him that I had just moved to L.A. and I was in film school and John Carpenter is my favorite director, da, da, da. <laughs> and he said, you want me to get you on set? And I'm like, good. He goes, well, when we walk in, just walk with me. And hopefully the security doesn't say anything because it's a closed set. So when we walked through the tunnel into the Coliseum past the security, I just walked next to him and talked to him. And we walked in on – I walked onto the field of the Coliseum. And he goes, so you can see where they're filming. I got to go. Good luck. <laughs> and he left me. And so I walked over. I was like triangulated between craft services and Video Village. And I got as close as I thought I could get to Video Village without raising suspicion because I'm just this young kid standing there. And I was – I thought at any moment someone would say – who are you? Yeah. What are you doing here? And so I was about 10 feet behind John Carpenter at the bank of monitors watching them film that basketball scene. And I didn't say anything to anyone. I was starving. I never walked over to craft services because I didn't want them to be like, who's that kid grabbing a Snickers bar? <laughs> um, but I stood there and then eventually they were filming like, like without any of the actors yet. They're doing technical stuff. And there was a short little guy standing next to me. And I never looked over and made eye contact or anything because I didn't want him to but, so I, but right. it's just this, I mean, tiny little guy standing next to me. And then I see Snake Plissken come walking out onto set. And I'm like, oh, damn, it's Snake Plissken. And he walks up. And as he gets near me, I realize it's not – it's the stunt double. I realize it's not Kurt Russell. <laughs> but the stunt double turns and waves at me. And then I realize he's waving at the guy next to me. So I finally kind of just – Little glance over and it's Kurt Russell standing next to me. He's this short. <laughs> I've been standing next to him for like 15 minutes and not made eye contact. And then I was like, and then he walked off to get ready to film. And I was like, oh man, he was right there. Next to me. That was my introduction to Hollywood. That's, that's, uh, that's a pretty awesome introduction. And John Carpenter. Especially just moving to LA. I don't know if anyone else would really have that experience. Yeah. And you know what, what it taught me was how technical, like this whole scene was all like like John Carpenter never left the monitor. He didn't give any direction. Well, it was Kurt Russell. He didn't have to. They'd made several films together at right. that point. But it, it, it really got me how much technical stuff goes into making big films. Like it was very complex with these cranes and watching the dolly. Well, that's another thing for beginning filmmaking. Don't do dolly shots if you can't get someone who knows what they're doing with the dolly because all you're going to do is waste your time and get shots that you can't use. <laughs> That's working a dolly good. is a skill it is not something that your friend can just you can't just rent a dolly and then have your friend run back and forth with it like you'll just waste a lot of time and footage yes and yeah <laughs> and money it's a skill um is there a place that people can go to see your work or um a facebook page for your films or oh, virtually film yeah let's see instagram as far as what i'm doing next so i wrote um i talked about this thriller that i wrote it's it's almost gone to production many times, and, and now it's being considered again. It would be great. If someone asked me what it was like, I would say, imagine John Wick meets Memento meets like a love, some big love story film. Oh, nice. It's really cool, and we're attached to direct it, and it would be the biggest budget thing that I've done. So fingers crossed, and uh, I'll make sure. Knock on knows. wood and yep. everything. Precisely. And then I wrote a TV pilot. I interviewed to, to get into a writer's room uh, last year. I didn't get in. Again, writer's rooms are all about chemistry and finding the right people. It's not just about being a good writer. On TV shows, you have to, you know, like they want six different, if there's six people in the room, they want six different voices to provide what they need for the show. So it's really like a matchmaking kind mm-hmm. of thing. But out of that, I decided to, to write another TV pilot, which I hadn't done in a long time. So I wrote a TV pilot that I really like. So I'm going to see what I can do with it this fall. I have a sequel to Virtually. It isn't written yet, but it's all outlined, so I'll be able to write it pretty darn quick. So when we get to the end of this one, if this one has some success and gets distributed in streaming or whatnot, and people really dig it, and most of the people who watch it seem to like it, I have a I have a sequel in mind. I don't think a lot of people like. Is this a short for a feature? I'm like, I'm not sure. I see a feature in in the Virtually story as it is, but there's a sequel that I'd love to to tell. That uh, I don't want to give away who it stars because that would give away some of some of virtually. Nice. Um, so I'm doing all that. 
And then on top of that, I'll be sound supervising three TV shows this fall because that isn't enough work. So I'll be doing <laughs> a TV show called Roswell in Mexico on uh, on CW, CW, which I do. I have seen. Uh, the nicest people. They're great people to work for. Uh, then I'll be doing a show called Sacred Lies Season 2 for Facebook. It's a, Facebook's getting into TV now. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I saw that at Comic-Con last year. Yeah. Rael, the creator of it, was one of the uh, executive producers of True Blood. Right. Um, and then I'll be doing season three of the show that most people are most excited about when I say I work on it, which is Cobra Kai, the yeah, continuation of YouTube, Karate Kid for yeah. YouTube. Mm-hmm. Um, again, great people to, to work with. And then um, as far as social media, I'm mainly on Twitter, at Soccer Nerd. <laughs> so it's soccer. Like, So my other passion, which we don't bring up on this podcast, is soccer. I'm a huge, huge soccer fan. Which uh, Are you following the Cup of America right now? Cup of America? Yeah, I've been following all. I was. I'm. A, I'm watching the Women's World Cup. I was watching. I'm a huge LA Galaxy fan. I've been a season ticket holder since second season. So, oh, nice. Uh, I was watching the Galaxy. So last night I watched the Galaxy. I watched the men play. I was watching the Copa America earlier in the day, and then I watched some of the Women's World Cup that I taped late last night. Yeah. It's, <laughs> uh, so soccer, soccer nerd, nerd. <laughs> but but with a U instead of an E to differentiate myself. So nerd is spelled N U R D. So if you want to see me talk about movie soccer and argue with people about politics on Twitter <laughs> at soccer. Go nerd. there. Go there. Uh, on Instagram, it's much easier. It's at P Patrick Hogan. So at all one word, like Instagram, P Patrick Hogan. And then, um, the, the movie itself has its own Instagram, which is at virtually underscore movie. And it's also on Facebook, uh, which is backslash virtually movie, no underscore. So underscore, for Instagram, no underscore for Facebook. For Facebook. <laughs> uh, and then jhdanger.com is the company website, which will um, – right now it doesn't have much on it, but now that we're beginning to win awards and stuff, we're going to have links to all the awards and we're going to have links to the videos and photos and links to all those social media things. And hopefully the JH Danger website is mainly for the future when we have multiple projects. So that will be the landing place for the whole company and as we get more – you know, the goal is this is not – the last the end, film. Yeah. This you is only continue. the first film. Right. Yeah. And as you grow and you continue to make more films, we hope to have you back on the show and talk about other, other projects as well. We would love to have you. Thank you so much, Patrick, for being on the show. This was amazing. You look forward to seeing what you have next on your plate. Thank you. Appreciate it. Please check out um, movingmanypodcast.com for all our content as well as subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, SoundCloud, or Google Play, where, wherever you listen to your podcast. And we'll be back next week with all new episode of Movie Menu Interviews. Thank you, everyone. Goodbye.